George, welcome to Business Spectator. It's great to be here. Now, um, 13 days since you became a listed public company. How, tell us about how life has changed for you and for the company. It's a pretty special time. Um, I've been in the role now, I just came up to about 13 years and uh, around four or five years into the role, the conversation about possible privatisation started to emerge and it's a while ago. Um, obviously we just, my job is to run the business rather than worry about the owner but that started to appear then and then we had the... Uh, but has, has things changed since the owner has changed? I mean, you know, it's, it's outwardly at least a huge difference. Yeah, that's right. Well, uh, you only have one layer of governance and the board is focused on uh, returning value to shareholders and the business plan is the plan that we own and uh, the stakeholder management has come down to a very simple framework now, whereas when you're owned by the government, stakeholder management's a very complex process. So, well, so it's simplified. Life is normal. It, so it's simplified running the business. It has, and yeah. life is, you say, normal now. Life is normal in terms of a six billion dollar corporation. Yeah. <laughs> Just going back one, yeah. uh, you're one of the few. You, you've substantially increased the Medibank profits. Uh, yeah. What's your advice to people in in government organisations as to how they can improve uh, their efficiency? Because you've done it. One of the things that uh, is very clear about Medibank when you turn up to the business or walk into the business is that it's a company. It's not a department of government. It doesn't have any of these sort of cultural overlays of uh, government run activities. So from the day I started we were a Melbourne base. We'd already moved from Canberra. The management team had already been recruited from the you know, private sector marketplace in terms of corporations in other places and and since then we've continued to invest in talent and, and skill sets and systems and capabilities that are you know, marketplace-based uh, capabilities rather than sort of doing, the thing, doing business the way government does business. Yeah, but having said that, you've just told us that life is now normal, that things have changed, that it is more simple, that stakeholder management is much more complex. So it is quite yeah. different, right? Well, yeah. You're running a corporation but also being sensitised to the way that corporation bumps into stakeholder issues. Uh, maybe a, a negotiation with a regional you know, private hospital group where the sensitivities about how they may travel in that negotiation are broader than just the commercial issues when you're government owned. So you know, we understand that and we sensitise our negotiation to that. Well that's sort of not there anymore. We're really about making sure that um, certainly we have to behave in a way that um, shows respect and uh, is consistent with our uh, brand and, and our reputation. Uh, but um, you know, we need to make sure that our customers can afford the health cover we provide, which means that we have to be very strong in our purchasing, very strong around our quality commitments, and also uh, even more so committed to the service culture of the company because without customers you can't make a bottom line. So that gets even more intense going forward. Well, as Robert said, you've, you know, you've increased profit enormously under government ownership. I, I figured out that it was over 10 years, 36% compound growth in profit. I mean, what can and will you do as a private company CEO to, to improve that? Or, can, you know, or is it impossible to improve it? No, the continuous improvement opportunities in health in Australia are significant. The 87 cents in every dollar of premium that we collect, that we pay out as claims, that 87 cents has opportunity within it to uh, purchase better, have less waste, um, have more consistent quality. And that's such a large part of our bill of materials, 87 cents in every dollar, uh, that the market leader leveraging its scale around quality and economics of size uh, to do a better job on that 87 cents is, is the opportunity in front of us. It's a very large opportunity. You're right? saying it'll really squeeze the life out of the private hospitals? No, not at all. Private hospitals are an important part of our value proposition. We're about private health cover. We need a very strong private hospital uh, network and, and industry to support our proposition. But uh, in that, the market leader should be able to procure services at the right quality and price that respects size and the economics of size. In, when you go to a hospital, uh, certainly I found, uh, that uh, the inefficiency is unbelievable. They're still operating paper systems. And I'm not being critical of the nurses. In fact, I've discussed it with the ACTU president, and we all agree. It's a mess. Um, and 
Is there any way you can change that? Well, the way we procure services now is a much more sophisticated approach than it has been in the past. When we started to install our new claims engines about three, to, three years ago, the big IMED claims engines, spent $200 million, three large processing systems, one for specialist claims, one for hospital claims, and one for our general cover ancillary claims. And everything now is straight through processing. Nothing's keyed in anymore, straight from the providers. And they go into these very large data warehouses. Now, all of what I've just described is new. And there aren't any health insurers in the 34 health insurers that have new claims engines. We're it, right? Significant investment in technology and capability. When they fall into, when all of those claims, five billion a year for Medibank, fall into the big data warehouses, we now mine that data. We use data and analytics to understand what we're consuming in healthcare for the four million lives we cover. And we benchmark what we see across 400 hospitals that we contract with and thousands and thousands of ancillary providers. And we see incredible unwarranted variation in the cost, frequency, and the quality of those services. We see revision rates that are way out of the bell curve. And we ask, why are we getting surgical revision rates so high in this part of the landscape? And we go in there and investigate. We find that there are costs that we're consuming there that are unproductive costs, not only for the health fund, but for the patient who's exposed to those costs. We find uh, frequencies of infection that are much, much higher across that landscape than in the mean or in the average areas. And then we say, so what is driving that variation? With that data and analytics, we now have healthcare insight. The people that have run our health businesses in Medibank now run all of that procurement as well. We gave them a broader assignment. So since when have you had this insight? For the, last, for the last couple of years, we've started to build. Right. And is that, is and that going to, is that now turning into actual profitability for you? Well, it gives us a lens on the 87 cents, which we believe is relatively unique as a lens for a large player, the size and understanding. We have the people in terms of health professionals in Medibank now who can understand the digestion of those large quantums of healthcare costs and the variation in quality. So when we go back to contract with the many providers that we contract with, we no longer just sit there and do an indexation negotiation, you know, the CPI adjustment. We come with loads and loads of information about what we purchased from this provider or their multi-sites last year, what we saw in that purchasing and how we benchmark that purchasing against the, the rest of the Australian landscape. And then we start to talk about the delta, the negative deltas of underperformance. And the first sort of statement we make is, well, if it's sub-average, why would Medibank pay for it? And why would a Medibank customer want to receive it? So how does that, how does that conversation unfold with the hospital? That's a sub-average hospital. What happens? You say, well, look, we're not going to pay. Well, clinical performance can be improved in any hospital. And we, in, in the hospitals we contract with, when we contract around quality and the quantum of service delivery, uh, we now say to the provider, we want to hold you accountable for the quality that we're purchasing and underperformance won't be paid for. Um, Overperformance can be a reward environment, and certainly we expect uh, that a consistency of performance across all the contracted sites. And that delta alone, if we were to remove the size and quantum of that delta as it's starting to emerge for us in turn, that, that has enough for us to be confident that we can drive value going forward. Um, to sort of answer your first question about the years of profitable growth, where will the future come from? in the quality of procurement. Because that's more than what well, Rob was talking about with waste. That's, a much, that's, a, that's um, an effectiveness of surgery issue. Is. Surgery revisions, uh, infections. But it is a quality measure. measure. Well, it's a quality, but it's not the paperwork that yeah. Rob was talking no, about. No, that, that's another item That's itself. another issue, which yeah. is... Um, yeah. But that does good. drive uh, not having an electronic health record or at least the history of that patient at the point of care can also contribute to poor quality as well. Um, so if you improve the standard of hospitals and medical, is there a danger that instead of that money going to the shareholders, in fact the regulator will say, aha, I can reduce the premiums on the health, uh, the health coverage? Yeah, I was wondering the same thing. Yeah. Well, we think um, the, the effort to go to saving costs or if you like reducing the year-on-year -year growth in healthcare costs by identifying underperforming healthcare and extracting that out of commercial negotiation so it becomes a save should be rewarded not penalised. Right? 
Yeah, it's a question of who gets rewarded. Well, the people because go to the, the, F- the customers might get rewarded by the regulator holding down premium. We have no issue around sharing our um, our yield in terms of better cost management with customer affordability. In fact, that is our plan. Uh, we know that we have to bring down, if you like, make the affordability of private health insurance um, a stronger proposition than it is today. We've got the rebate eroding every year because of the differential in indexation between the rebate and CPI versus health CPI. So the 30% rebate is now 28% going forward and going lower and lower. So we're concerned about that. So somebody who receives a 6% premium increase now also loses one and a quarter in their rebate. So they're getting a seven and a quarter premium increase. So we, we, we feel that stress for customer. So how are we going to help them? We need to procure well, get some save in the procurement for both bottom line and customer affordability. That's our plan. You're going to put the squeeze on the other health funds, aren't you? Um, well, we want to certainly compete in a way where we provide more value for the money that's being asked for. Absolutely. And, and will you... One of the objectives of privatising Medibank from the Minister himself was to increase the, the competition in the sector by privatising Medibank. Well, well, then, will you look to take some of those over? Sorry? Will you look to take over some of the rivals because they have struggled? Well, this is a sort of a funny sort of sector in that. And you know, ask the M&A question. And on the roadshow, we, we were asked at every one of the 150 you know, <laughs> investor meetings. Um, it's, it's a very long tail, isn't it? 34 funds. <laughs> Uh, the top five or six are, you know, make up around 85% of the uh, members in the sector. If you look at Medibank's near 30% share, we, we lose about 3% market share a year in laps and we acquire roughly the same. If you, that 3% market share that moves in and out of Medibank, 10%, we're slightly under 10, we're about 9 in the laps rate, slightly under industry average. That, that laps, if you go down to the grid, say to a health fund like Australian Unity, just over 3%, and then below them, another 27 funds in size. So in the M&A conversation, the question is, Medibank, you need to get your own house in order first before you go out shopping for other health funds. There are 3% market share leaving your book every year, as does the others in terms of labs. But why wouldn't we invest in better retention systems, the capability of saving the customers we already have, which is a much better economic proposition in terms of investment and return, then go shopping for somebody else's customers. Now, we have all of that value opportunity in our own shop. And it won't cost you goodwill. That's right. And also the distraction of the M&A. Now, we, we've acquired AHM four or five years ago. They were in distress. I don't know of any other health fund that's in distress. I think you need that to sort of uh, facilitate an M&A. So we're not relying on that to make the future happen for us. Um, what about your own margins? Um, I think Bupa, Bupa's underwriting margins are 300 basis points um, better than yours. So uh, what are you going to do to to get your margins to, to that uh, level? Yes, you're alluding to that page in the prospectus where there's some historical data around uh, net operating margins and uh, I think we were at about 3.7 or something in that grid at the time in 2013 and Bupa was around uh, just over 6. Um, where well, we landed the year at 4.4, we got a prospectus margin of net of 4.9. So you, know, you can see a very strong growth path uh, as we move up the scale in margin growth. Uh, so we're investing in the continuation of that through the 87 cent strategy of managing healthcare costs uh, in a sustainable long-term so way. So that gets back to the 87 cents. Right? Yeah, absolutely. And, and the underperforming costs in the 87 cents. I'll, I'll give you another example of that. Um, so we'll look across the spectrum on claims data on dental uh, claiming. And we know the number of chairs versus the volume and claiming ratios. The, the analytics team can discern consumption rates. And they find a series of providers who have enormous volume ratios for, for chairs. And we go and do a, a, an audit and we discover that someone is defrauding the fund. They're just cranking the card without a patient. And, uh, and we deregister them and, and hand them over to authorities if it is fraud. So the, the whole idea of the 87 cents is that, like other areas of the financial services sector, there is leakage. And smart operators use systems, people who understand the health system, a third of our workforce are health professionals, who then use data and analytics that come from our invested systems to make our organisation a better procurer of health services with a tighter control over the consumption of those services and a more consistent approach to quality. 
We're running into an Australian society, according to Treasury, where income growth per capita is, is going to not rise. Um, it's crazy. Fall to almost nil. Um, that's already affecting um, discretionary expenditure over many areas. Yes. Um, do you think it will affect discretionary expenditure over private health? That people will say, well, sorry, I just, I just can't afford that anymore. My income's not going up and my mortgage is where it is and whatever it is, other costs I've got. Good question, Robert. So um, I think we're into probably third generation of private health as a sort of a paradigm in Australia. So it's been around for a while. It certainly is a significant participation rate, around 50% of the population, which is very high compared to some of the other markets in the world. And we certainly got some feedback when we went around the roadshow from some of the international investors. So firstly, I think um, we, we need to understand that the price of health insurance in Australia, because it's community rated and has the assistance of the rebate, along with the uh, tax incentives that you know, compel people to, uh, to buy after the age of 30. Those three very important government variables do drive strong participation and we've seen that consistent even through very significant down cycles in the economy. Um, the subsidiser in Australia is not the employer, it's the government. So being in employment uh, is so important for participation in private health in North America and the UK. In Australia, the mechanisms are independent of employment. That's a really good thing. Secondly, the price we pay because it's community rated and it's risk equalised is that a, a, a $4,000 comprehensive family cover in Australia, you know, 50 year old parents and teenage children, one cover for four people, here is $4,000, less the rebate, $2,800 per year. In the interviews we had in North America and the UK, they said, per month. I said, no, per year. They said, how do you do it so low? Now, I know that on a global basis, we may be a winner, i.e. our price point is much, much lower than those North Amer Northern Hemisphere markets. In Australia, mums and dads see the increases every year and they may stress out. So who, who would be concerned, apart from the health insurers who have their own self-interest in this particular question, Australian government would be concerned to see the participation rate lower because we keep 50% of the Australian population out of public hospitals through private health cover and private hospital care. And that pressure off our public system keeps our healthcare expenditure as a nation to below 10% of GDP still. Whereas Europe and the OECD averages are now into the 11s and 12s. In the US we know it's at 18% and totally out of control. So I think we have a set of policy frameworks in Australia, which bipartisan governments have supported for over around 15 years now. And if we did see a degradation in the participation rate, I'm sure we would see government come to the party along with the sector saying we've got to fix this because ultimately everyone pays more if we see a significant part of the privately insured population move to public care. Last time I spoke to you, you talked about how you're going to, you're starting to get involved in primary health care and yes. start to uh, concierge uh, chronic patients That's right. at the doctor level. Uh, will that have a benefit for the public system as well as the private system? Absolutely. We, we certainly share uh, our gains in cost management with the broader system. We, you know, we can't put a fence around those saves and, and shield the rest of the sector from them to keep them all ourselves. So we explain how the savings work that, in what you're going to do. Well, firstly, the cost that we're trying to save. 2% two, two of our customers claim 35% of our hospital claims. 2% claim 35%. So we paid out $5 billion last year in total claims. Just under $4 billion were hospital claims. So about $1.2 billion uh, uh, hospital claims from the 2%. We know them by name. We know all our customers by name. So how do we deal with these that particular... That 2% is a small number, as you say. Small number. So how do we deal with this cost in our book? Well, firstly, it's a customer need. It's a complex customer. Uh, their KPIs, as we do the analytics, show that this group of individuals go to hospital four times in four years. That's how we find them. You know, who's gone to hospital for four or less over that? And then some of them go to hospital four times in one year, but overall it's four years, four times. That's the basket. Just over 2% of our members claim 35% of our claims in hospital. So as we get to understand who these people are, because we go find out, we have our focus groups, our conversations, our outbound calls, we understand that they have several issues. 
Um, some of them might be just old and frail. Others, English is not a first language. Others, they have a mental health problem. Lots of issues. Getting to the primary care system on time, fronting up to all that it can offer, not missing those appointments is the problem. So how do we get more of the primary care system for these high claimers so that they, have to, they, they don't default as often into the acute care system? Because we know they don't want to go there. It's just that if you don't get enough primary care, you'll be in acute care, especially if you have high needs. So the Medibank business has a very significant telehealth capability. You have 800 nurses and docs doing 24-7 to run all of the health direct nurse on call and health line services in Australia and New Zealand. We've used some of that capability to create a concierge. We facilitate a, a concierge link with the general practitioner of these high needs patients. And we do the very best we can to encourage them through the primary care system, make the bookings, turn up with the transport, get them there on time. We're doing some trials now in Victoria and in Western Australia to prove the point that if you do significantly invest in this coordination of primary care, you will lower unnecessary acute care. And uh, it's still about three or four months away before we do some evaluation. But it's just another example. We talked about the 87 cents before. There's also the 2% that claim 35, another concentrated area of health costs that we're working on. It's just a bit like uh, Tony Abbott's co-payment, you know, with the, the $5, and you're actually trying to achieve the same thing in a different way. We're funding it. So we're happy as a health fund. Yeah, I understand you're funding it, but you're actually trying to achieve the same objective. We're not passing these costs on to No, no, no I understand that. Yes. One more point. Going back to the prospectus. Uh, do you think it's fair to say you're just a little bit naughty? Um, uh, you've sold the Medibank shares at, uh, um, on a yield of 4.2%, and that uh, involved paying out 89% of the profit uh, in dividends. But you also said, well, we should really pay 75%. So um, wouldn't it have been better to actually have just paid the 75% of profit in the current, in the year, the current year, uh, rather than to push it up, which got the premium a bit higher than it should have been? Well, the, the engineering of what was paid out uh, was done where government is a, an owner of the company, right? We go right up to the sale point and the prospectus is the government in, in its handover. Um, so whatever conversations were had that produced that outcome, uh, you know, they were very much at the time where the Australian government was very much in control of the sale process and, that, and that's very clear. But I don't believe we've hidden the detail. It's clearly stated in the prospectus. We make a, a, a strong case about what the um, normalised yields are, yes, which are know. not the same yields as it's the first clear, year. Yeah. Yeah. But it, 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 what you're saying is it was naughty, but, but it was the government's fault. fault. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm just saying that the owner has brought the company to market and as you can see, and it's all there for everyone to see, that it was uh, well received, uh, oversubscribed. People are excited about our mission and our brand and the role, the role we're going to play in the future. Well, you better to maintain the dividend rate. Our commitment is that laid out in the prospectus. We're not saying anything beyond prospectus there. We can't, but we're committed to you, the you business. Certainly commit, you'll certainly pay the, the dividend for the year into June 30. We certainly made the case that 70 to 80 percent. Next year afterwards, you actually hedge it a bit. Um, because we have a capital policy between 12 and 40 percent of our uh, uh, premiums uh, form the basis of our capital policy. And uh, our capital policy in the mid 11s needs to be restored to that midpoint. So we want to um, make sure that we do that. So that's why the. Really, to maintain the dividend at, at, the, at the rate in, that you're going to pay in 2014 and 15, your 87 cents and, your, and, your, and, the, and the other efforts have to really work, don't they? Absolutely. But you, I mean, Wayne Swan got special dividends out of you. I mean, the last three years of Wayne Swan, he got a billion dollars off you. They did. So we can expect special dividends, can't we? Well, if you look at the trajectory... Oh, I'm glad that you had that. <laughs> yeah, I think Rob has answered the question, Alan. Um, obviously, oh, the money's gone. <laughs> obviously, uh, the capital reduction program in the period of for-profit conversion, which was the last five years, brought us through an efficient capital base, and that was the capital entry point for the float. Um, to get there was a series of special divs, along with the ordinaries. Um, uh, you can't go below that any, any further. So, we, you know, we've had our period of special divs. Um, if the business performs well in the future and that can create capital that's best to be returned, the board can make that decision or we could be invested in growth. We'll see what the future brings. We'll have to leave it there, George. Thank, Thank you. George. Thank you very much.